In Genesis 1, it talks about a beginning. In the beginning. Bereshit bera. God created. Let's look at the idea of absolute beginning. Okay? There has to be a sufficient cause for something to happen. There can't just be a cause for something to happen. And my favorite ones, if we were standing by the street and we see a bowling ball come by, a bowling ball roll by, what are we going to do? We're going to watch the ball and start. We're going to look that way. So where did it come from? But what if we look that way and there's a frog, nice fat toad sitting there. Look what that frog. So that's not sufficient to roll that 12-pound bowling ball down the road. So we, it has to be not just a cause. It has to be a sufficient cause. Very important rule in physics. Something from nothing. No. Something created something, and the something he created was matter, space, and time. E equals mc squared. Energy or power equals the mass times the speed of light squared. So from this Einsteinian equation, it can be deduced that power can create mass. That's not a theory. That's a understood. That's accepted as truth. And we've actually done this several years ago. I, before I even researched this, I, I think the Lord just spoke to me one day, and, and I'm looking at that equation. I'm going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And it just hit me. And I grabbed, I, I just happened happen to have, um, two recent graduates, uh, engineers, okay? Both had just graduated, one in the field of mechanical engineering and one electrical engineering. I said, I grabbed them. I said, I need your help. I want to turn that equation into the power of God. Okay, show me how to do it. It filled up two whiteboards, but we demonstrated it. The, the pair of them working together demonstrated. I have pictures of it somewhere. You know, I was like really excited. And then I found out that all the physicists know this. They just don't talk about it, you know, because it involves God, okay? So, but it, it does work. Um, we've done the math. And, you know, again, um, um, in another realm, fission in a nuclear reactor gives off energy from heat. And in that process, this is very interesting, the reverse of that is nuclear fission. So when you put, a, if you put uranium or plutonium or whatever you're using, there's, you know, one of the substances in your reactor and burn it, allow it to give off energy, it actually just reduces in mass. It starts reducing. Where did it go? You literally have less mass than you started with, okay? It turned into energy. It literally shifted from mass to energy. So it's the reverse of creation. Nuclear fission really is the reverse. It's very interesting. That fusion is a bizarre process where it goes the other way too. So it, it can cross that equal sign barrier. Um, this is interesting because when we start talking about colliders and, and CERN and the Hadron Collider and all that, the inverse happens when you put an extreme amount of power into a particle collider and accelerate the particles at each other. It actually uses up energy in the process and the particles become heavier. Extra mass is created. Now, they've only been able to, most of this stuff lasts in the realm of a millionth of a second. Because sometimes what you create is this bizarre stuff called antimatter. I know it ran the Starship Enterprise, but it's actually real stuff. Um, really hard to keep anywhere because when it touches matter, it disappears. Okay? It's because it, but there is such a thing. But it is possible, we've demonstrated that it is possible, physics have demonstrated today it's very possible, um, not only in theory, but in reality, for energy to create mass and for mass to be turned into energy. So we can go both directions with that. Therefore, for God to create a massive amount of, <laughs> the massive amount of mass in the universe, all he needed is an unfathomable amount of energy or power, which is what he is. Now, man doesn't like that. So we have to, we can't mess with the hard physics of Einstein very much, so we just try to change the Word of God, right? There are a lot of modern variations that I want to make you aware of in our Bibles today. Um, just because you're going to run into them. I just want you to know they're there. Here's one. Genesis 1, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth being unformed and void. Like, wait a minute, that's not like, that's, that doesn't sound like absolute creation anymore, right? Um, this is called, uh, this is a translation called a subs substantivile clause. I can't even say it, okay? Um, it's actually very common in the Hebrew Bible. There's over 200 clauses like this, and the early translators, um, Jewish and Christian translators, understood them, and they translated them throughout Scripture. And 
But if you, all of a sudden, in modern time, we've decided to translate it a different way. It's also called a dependent clause translation. This is 1985, Jewish Publication Society. The early ones didn't do that. This is a 1985, modern stuff. Okay, they started doing that. So in recent times, what we're seeing is a lot of Hebrews are starting to say, well, it doesn't really mean that. And, and for them, the, their reasoning for changing the traditional for thousands of years understanding of all the translators and theologians and people who have done it for thousands of years is not based on their interpretation but on their retranslation of this clause. Okay, Here's another one. They're doing the same thing. It's another way to do it. In the beginning of creating. okay, It gets translated that way. It's the same thing. It's just re, retranslating it. Here's another one. Um, in the beginning of, in a beginning, God created. Okay, um, That one actually, these are based on the language and the markings of the Masoretic text. Now, the Masoretic text is very interesting. It's what every one of your Bibles is translated from. I don't think anybody in here has one that's not translated from that. Very common. Um, but I've always said that it's real important to know your translator's bias, if they have one, and if they're human, they have one, right? I mean, the Masoretes had issues, just like I do, and you do, you know, we have our, our biases. And so, what is the bias there? Let's take a look. Um, here's a um, Masoret, this is uh, Adam Clark. Adam Clark, actually, 1810, he wrote this, he's a Bible scholar, very popular, um, Commentary, the Clark's Bible commentary, very, very popular, been around for many years. Here's what he says about the Masoretic text, which you would think you'd have great respect for, right? Because he's a Bible translator. He said, the Masoretes are commentators. The system of punctuation, now think about this. The Masoretes in about between 800 and 1,000, it was a process, but mostly around, we'd say around 850, the, the Torah is finished, but it continued into other books. They came in and they wanted to preserve the pronunciation of the Hebrew language. In the original text, the words are all run together, okay? And you kind of have to know what it says to know what it says. And so they came in and they come up with a system of vowel points that most likely they probably created. We don't know where they came from. They probably invented them. And we use it today to know how to pronounce Hebrew. I mean, when you see... When you see the Hebrew up there, you use those vowel points. The same, you know, and, and it shows us how the words go. And they decided where to separate them. Da, 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 da. But think about the possibility. Because very subtle, 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 subtle changes in Hebrew or just putting a little vowel point makes a, it makes a huge difference, doesn't it, Marcy? If you just move one little thing, one little, one little thing. It's a huge difference. Okay. And so what Adam Clark is saying, if you think about it, this system of punctuation is a continual gloss, which is an old English word for a commentary, on the Torah and the prophets. Their vowel points and their prosaic and metrical accents give every word to which they are affixed a peculiar kind of meaning, depending on how you point it, okay? Which in their simple state, in other words, without that, multitudes of these words, what he's saying here, cannot bear what has been done to them. Very interesting. This system, he says, is one of the most artificial, particular, I thought it said peculiar, and extensive comments ever written on the Word of God. Now, this is coming from a Bible commentator. He's a commentator saying about, I had never thought about this until I started looking at it. I was like, oh my goodness. We have to be careful with the man-made pointing. Make sure, and that's what he's saying. We have to be careful with this, okay? So again, it's important to know what their bias is because they're going to hopefully do it honorably. But if they're biased, for example, if they were evolutionist, we know when an evolutionist looks at the Bible or looks at any paper, or looks at scientific evidence, supposedly, it's biased, right? We know that uh, an atheist would look at something, he's going to be biased. We know that a believer looks at something, he's going to be biased. Everybody's biased, okay? So it's really important to know what your Bible translator or your commentator's biases are. But this is Hebrew. It's not a translation. But it is a translation when you think about it. Over a thousand years earlier, we have another text. 
okay? It's called a Septuagint, and it came from around 250 B.C. It was translated into Greek from the Hebrew. It's the oldest text we have available today, a thousand years older than the text in your Bible, okay? And the Greek, being Greek, it is very specific, and in the Greek, it translates back into English, in the beginning, very specific, God made the heaven and the earth. It's real simple. It's real straightforward. Okay? And so we have something there. Now this is interesting. Physics actually bears this out. You know what we've looked at. It bears it out. That what seems like a physical impossibility to a man in ancient times is the basis for modern nuclear physics. That the power of the spoken word of God can simply make it. And so I would defer to something that's a thousand years older with no bias. I could, we could do, we could spend all our time on the bias of the Masoretic text. Who were a group in Tiberias, okay, who were not under the, the, the translators of the Septuagint, for example, were appointed and directed by the Sanhedrin and by the high priest to go and do this Greek translation. The translators and the pointer, the vowel point system from the Masorites was done in Tiberias. The temple was destroyed. The priesthood was gone. And this is the same source, the same people, same area, literally same town, where the Talmud was written. So we know they have bias. And one of their bias, of course, is the, uh, very strong anti-Yeshua bias, anti-Messiah bias. And, but that's really not what we're even looking at. But I'm just saying, just recognize that there is a bias there. And so if we have something this critical, it's worth going back and looking at the oldest text available. Amen? So let's look at facts as a missing link. We know evolution likes to talk about missing links, right? Well, one of the missing links in the theory of evolution are the facts themselves. And so a lot of times these missing links uh, are taught as fact when in, when in fact they're not. Um, this actually comes, the uh, part we're about to do comes from a little pamphlet that uh, CMI does. CMI, Creation Ministries International, has been here many times. It's creation.com. And um, we're actually talking with them right now about helping us with a much larger program that we are working on. Okay? And here's the question. That was just a teaser, so you make sure you're here. How did life originate? Evolutionist professor Paul Davies admitted, quote, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized themselves into the first living cell. Andrew Knoll, professor of biology at Harvard, said, we don't really know how life originated on this plant, planet. A minimal cell needs several hundred proteins, even if every atom in the universe were present for the experiment with all the correct amino acids for every possible molecular vibration in the supposed evolutionary age of the universe, not even one average size functional protein would form. So how did life with hundreds of proteins originate just by chemistry without intelligent design? Good question. How about the DNA? You hear a lot about DNA lately, okay? The code is a sophisticated language of systems and letters that words and words where the meaning of the words is unrelated to the chemical properties of the letters. Just as the information on this page or on this screen or pixels is not a product of the chemical properties of the ink or the pixels in the computer. Okay. So what other coding system has existed like that without intelligent design? How does a DNA coding system arise without it being created? They ignore their stuff. This is just stuff they ignore. Why is natural selection, a principle recognized by creationists, taught as evolution as if it explains the origin of the diversity of life? Okay. Natural selection presupposes that there's something to select from. This is like real critical. It isn't, I'm just, I'm just, you, this is free. Think about it. Natural selection, it selects from what's there. Okay. There's no poodle DNA in a frog, even though poodles jump. Okay. Sometimes they act like frogs. Okay. 
But it says, by definition, it is a selective process, selecting from already existing information. So it is not a creative process. It might s explain the survival of the fittest, why certain genes benefit in certain environments, but not the arrival of the fittest. Where did the genes and the creatures come from in the first place? Okay. Why are the expected countless millions of transitional fossils missing? If there's millions and millions and millions of steps between the goo and you, where are the fossils? You go out and you look in a rock pile, you will recognize the kind, which is the word the Bible uses, of every, rock, of every shell that's there. Where are the shells with wings on them? Where are the shells with the eight legs and the twelve legs and the two heads and the three? I'm going to see. They don't exist. And there should be, to quote a, a, a PhD scientist at the University of Florida, when I asked about this question, he said, there would be, we would be wading in a sea of bones that we don't recognize. He said, we wouldn't be looking for a missing link. We would be looking for anything we would recognize. For every million fossils, there would be one we would even recognize if this were true. Okay? Mathematics bears that out. Darwin actually noted the problem, and it still exists today. The evolutionary family tree in textbooks is based on imagination, not fossil evidence. Harvard paleontologist and evolutionist Stephen Gould wrote, The extreme rarity of transitional forms of the fossil record pers persist as a trade secret of paleontology. And there are other evolution and experts that also admit the problem. Here's a good one. If evolution is the basis of this supposed science, this question, where are the scientific breakthroughs due to evolution? Dr. Mark Kirshner, chair of the Department of Systems Biology, Harvard Medical, stated, in fact, over the last 100 years, almost all biology has proceeded independent of evolution, except evolutionary biology itself. Molecular biology, biochemistry, physiology have not taken evolution into account at all. Okay? Dr. Schell wrote, It is our knowledge of how these organisms... Organisi <laughs> it is our knowledge of how these organisms actually operate, not our speculation about how they may have arisen millions of years ago that is essential to doctors, veterinarians, and farmers. Evolution actually hinders medical discovery. Then why do schools and universities teach evolution so dogmatically, stealing time from the experimental biology that so benefits humankind? We're going to get to why. Science involves experimenting, experimenting to figure out how things work, how they operate. Why is evolution, a theory about history, taught as if it were the same as operational science. You cannot do experiments or even observe what happened in the past. Ask if evolution had been observed. Richard Dawkins, the famous evolution, replied, um, evolution has been observed. It just hasn't been observed um, while it's happening. <coughs> yeah, that's sounds fun. Why is it a fundamentally religious idea, a dogmatic belief system that fails to explain the evidence taught as science? Why is it taught in science classes? Carl Kepler, famous philosopher of science, said, Darwinism is not a testable scientific theory, but a metaphysical or religious research program. Michael Roost, evolutionist, science philosopher, admitted, quote, Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution today. And if you can't teach religion in the science classes, why is evolution even taught? Well, amen to that. And the reason is because men have been duped into believing that God is the enemy and the cause of his problems, when in fact, he's not the enemy. He's actually the solution. And when we're willing to step into that truth, our world is going to change. Yeah. And shalom will reign. That day is coming. With or without our help, that day is coming. Okay. But really, if it's freedom 
that mankind wants. And that's what they say this is all about. We want freedom. Yeshua has already made the way for that. Yeshua said to the Judeans who had believed him, said, if you remain in my word, my word, my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Where do you find the truth? In his word. Yeshua said, I am the way, I am the truth. You want the truth? Do we really want the truth? That's where it is. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.